forgetting to hit record, but I've actually remembered, so that's a good thing. Um, so tonight, we are going, once again, international. And for those of you that are not familiar with Federation of Jewish Men's Club, we are the conservative Jewish movement, uh, men's, men's club organization. We are all lay led. Um, our president is Tom Sudo, who is actually on the call. We have a past president, Stan Greenspan. He's the Canadian guy I've been talking to, who has all the uh, nice Hanukkah donuts behind him. Um, and we're very excited. We've been doing this really since March. We have what we call a, a, a affinity groups. We have a sports one that David Kravitz, who's also on this call, and myself also run. Uh, we have a Yiddish club. Uh, we have a genealogy, and soon we're going to have a finance group. Six people. So uh, again, please mute yourself uh, if you're already, or else I'll mute you for you. Um, so we definitely have a very nice representation tonight. Um, we have many members of Temple Emmanuel, not surprising because our chef is uh, Shireen Michelin. Uh, her husband, Rob Finkel, uh, is a brotherhood guy like me, media, also a past president. Um, and I can tell you, Shireen is a terrific cook because I've experienced myself. Um, I'm going to hand it over to her. And what I would ask is just a few things. Um, if you have questions, please use the chat, and I will filter those questions to Shireen as we go along as appropriate. Just please do keep yourself on mute because it becomes very distracting to uh, the rest of us and uh, certainly to Shireen. So without any further ado, here's Shireen. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, so glad you're with us today. Um, Danny asked me to do a cooking class a while back. And at the time I said to him, you know, I really can't. It's a lot of time to prepare. Um, I work as a teacher and that was all in flux this year. You know, I have my own kids. Um, but he came back and asked me again in November. And I waited a week or two, but, um, and at the same time, I was seeing those images on the news, which I'm sure many of you have seen of the long lines at food pantries. And that image was very disturbing to me. And I wanted to do something about it, but I wasn't sure how or what. And then I thought back to Danny's ask that I do a cooking class and he, and I asked if we could do it. If I did it, could we do it for a food, um, a, a hunger related, Cause uh, organization and Danny agreed, um, and that's what brought us to the Mazon request from all of you for being a part of this class today. So I really want to thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to teach, and also to thank you for stepping forward to help families in need right now. Um, when I teach, I, I feel um, my humanity at its greatest. I love sharing knowledge as much as I love gaining it. Um, just last week, myself, I took a cooking class on Zoom to make a challah. And it was just, whenever I'm in a learning situation, I love it. It just is it's so awakening for me. So I really hope that although we're separated by Zoom and you're not in my house with me, I can give you a taste of um, Persian cuisine and introduce some very approachable recipes try on your own um, through the course of the next hour. So as we get started, the first thing I just wanted to, um, since you're coming into my kitchen, as a good Persian hostess, I would have um, food for you to offer you and drinks. My husband's saying go this way. Um, to you. Offer you for um, as my guest. So this is what I have out for you here. Um, there would be like a bowl with some fruit and fresh cucumbers. Can you tell that? Yes. Ooh. And um, often there'll be like knives. Persians are um, like going to, you go to their house, they'll have like a knife and um, out. And often the hostess or one of the guests who's more related to the host will sit down and cut some of the fruit and they'll pass around the plate for everyone to try it. That's one piece of the hospitality. And then there's always some kind of a sweet. So what I did today is I went to the Persian bakery in Watertown and I got some sweets that are also connected to Hanukkah, which I thought would be fun for you to see. Um, I mean, we can't see you. We can't, can't see, see you. you. No. 
You're you're on the oh, left here. And we're I need to see my you. cameraman over here. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Because I can see myself. No, I know. I know. We can see you on the little screen, but not the big one. Oh, you have you're, to pin me. You're good now, Shereen. Okay. All right. Now. So um. Anyway, so this is what I have. And if you have time to go to Watertown, it's a it's a um you know a small business and it'd be great to support him especially if you go on the weekend that's probably when everything is at its peak so there are these little um balls called bombier and this is like fried dough if you had that as a kid at the fair it's a hundred thousand times better um and this is another thing called zalubia it's also like a thin crunchy dough that's also fried and then dipped in a sugar syrup and then these are I forget the name, but it's um, also a pressed fried cookie with powdered sugar on it. Um, and an interesting thing is that Persians often have the sweets before the meal, not after the meal. Like the idea of dessert is like when the meal's over, you're done. And they'll have sweets as an appetizer to the main dish. So um, the first thing I want to do, let me put on my hot water. So there's a couple of things that um, I consider like the deal breakers of really good Persian food. All right, things that you want to make sure you do that make the big difference in your <laughs> You have to go. So, um, so one of those things is saffron. So I'm going to show you a little bottle of saffron. This is one right here. Yeah, this is good. And if you, and let me see if I can bring it up to, close to the camera. Um, you can see the, um, it has, it's like little um, strands. When you buy your saffron, um, you want to buy, a, um, you buy it and it, it comes like this and it's not very useful. To maximize the flavor, what you do is you, tie, you, dip, you pour this into something like a mortar and pestle or you can improvise. You add a pinch of sugar and then you grind it up. And that makes it into a nice powder. And it kind of sounds like a big, uh, what's the Yiddish word for a big fuss? Uh, simis. It sounds like a big simis, but it's worth it. So what you do in this recipe, and I want to also note that um, in addition to the two recipes, I gave you all a packet that goes over Persian ingredients, and it talks about how to make this saffron um, condiment that's like central to almost every Persian dish. So the way that it works is you, I'm going to pour, I have a nice um, measuring glass, and I pour some of this saffron powder in it, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm boiling water. And just so you know, so you're not surprised, saffron is a great at staining things, so you always want to be careful. So while my water boils, basically what I'm going to do is add boiling water just a little bit, and it's going to make like a saffron tea. And that tea, I'm going to add to the different dishes that I'm making today to give them that floral flavor. One of the key flavors of like the Persian palate is that I, the floral uh, taste. And um, often they put rose water in their desserts. But also that scent is... Hang on. Someone else joined us? Um, is what is important part of the food. Which actually I'm going to... And, and it's a part of everything that you make, even down to the rice. So I have these two rices here. This is um, a brand of Persian basmati rice that I bought at a Persian store. And then I have Trader Joe's brown basmati rice. Sometimes I have Trader Joe's white basmati rice. But the difference is in this, is really in the smell. And that translates to the flavor. So if you're ever at a store buying really good quality rice, you want it to have that smell um, because that really translates over into the flavor. So this is a brand, this is like my favorite brand right now. It's called Tilda and they sell it at Persian markets. But I will say if you're a Costco shopper and you ever want to buy Persian uh, food, uh, rice, the basmati rice at Costco is great. So um, let me get my boiling water. Okay, 
So I'm going to add it to this. And let this sit, just, just kind of hang out now. I have it ready now for the next phase. Okay. So, so what we're going to do now is go over how to prepare rice. So, um, in Persian cooking, someone asked earlier before everyone joined, um, we start off with the rice by washing it. And I don't know his, like, where that comes from, but I would imagine this is a very ancient cuisine with, which has, I think, in a lot of ways, it maintained a lot of the traditions of how they prepare the food. And it's rushed. So the first step is always to wash your rice. And basically what I do is I take a bowl like this that can fit the rice care, uh, you know, comfortably. And the way you wash it is you actually fill up the bowl with water, let the water settle, and then you just pour off the liquid on top. And then I do that again four or five times. If I have the time, the next step which I do, and this is all written down, is I actually let it soak in this state for like, um, six hours or sometimes even overnight. So for example, if I'm cooking a Shabbat dinner um, and I know I'm serving rice that night, in the morning before I leave for work, I'll wash my rice and just let it, to, let it sit. And that, a, a big part of Persian culture is that the, uh, is, and food, so much of it is actually about the rice. Um, I happen to know there's three different words for rice. And I remember as a kid, I heard that like Eskimos have multiple names for snow. I feel that way about Persians and rice. Like they, there's different kinds of rice and they all have different names and how you cook it is, is different. So then the name is different. So you can have like rice that's steamed versus rice that's baked. And um, so that is a little bit about that. So after I've come home, I, you've soaked your rice, we're ready to start cooking it. So what I'm doing right now is I brought up the water and I'm waiting for it to boil. So what I want to ask Dan is, are there any questions right now I can answer while I'm waiting for the water to boil? Uh, let's see. I'll let people in while you do that. I can't read my, I'm, I'm not no. wearing my reading glasses, so I can't see. No questions oh, yet? No questions yet. Oh, uh, there's the Persian market in Watertown. What's that? Everyone, please stay muted. Just use the chat if you have a question. So, so basically, if you look at the, the instructions for the rice, I've walked you through. Um, okay. So actually, what I did, just because I am a, I'm a special educator, is that I wrote down also a schedule to make rice because I find that. That's how I, I function myself now. I love having schedules and breaking things down to see how long it takes. So you'll see that on the second page if you printed it. Um, and I did it so that you really get an idea of how long it takes. Um, while it seems like a lot, you can get, if you do it multiple times, of course it becomes easier and also it can be broken down. So I like that I can wash the rice in for five minutes and be done with that phase. And then I can come home from work and do the first level of preparation, which I break down in the directions and then take a break and do other things. And then I come back 45 minutes before serving and I finish it up. So where we are right now in our directions is we've cleaned the rice and we're leaving it in warm water. I'm bringing water to a boil and I'm gonna boil my rice as soon as the water boils, which actually brings me to another point. Really important in Persian cuisine is that the quality and the heaviness of your pot. So if you think about it like this, this is a very um, ancient way of cooking, right? They cooked over a fire. And so you wanted a heavy pot so that things would go slowly and not burn. Interestingly, also a lot of Persian dishes, you kind of start when you do braises or even the rice, as you'll see with the potato crust, you almost make like a nest and then you put the food on top of it so that if it does burn, the, the more, um, the more valuable food and the more nutritious food that's on top of the nest doesn't get destroyed. So I 
really like these Cafalon pots that I get actually at TJ Maxx, and they have some good ones in stock now. I'm going to show you what I like. Um, this is a small one, but it's this kind of a look. Can you see that? Um, but also, I have um, other ones too, but you really want that heaviness so that the heat gets transferred and it doesn't cook too fast. So I'm going to add my salt. Sorry, we do have some questions now. Go ahead. Okay. Are you ready? From Effie. What is the name of the rice and where can we get it? Okay, so it's Basmati rice. And if you live in Massachusetts, um, it's Effie, so she lives in Newton. Okay, sorry, I can't, I can't make out everything. So in Watertown, there's two stores that are sell, there's a lot of places, but I'm just gonna give a plug to two Persian places. One of them is Tabrizi Bakery, which is right in Watertown Square. And a couple blocks up near the Armenian um, stores is a Persian grocery store. It goes by two names, Roxana Market or Superhero Market. It used to be called Superhero, now Roxana bought it and they're kind of having an identity issue. But both stores are so clean. The people who work there are so helpful. Um, and I really, if you wanna do a field trip ever there, I'll meet you. I love going there and, um, you know, it's dangerous for me because I'll violate too much stuff. So it's basmati rice is the kind you want. What I did like though, I wanna put in a, is that at the bakery, if you're kind of like waiting in this water and you don't wanna to commit to a 20 pound bag of rice, the bakery was selling um, smaller bags, I would say like this size, of good quality Persian rice, which might seem more approachable. And I really appreciated how we had those smaller bags because it can feel like a big commitment to buy this huge bag of rice. And also, frankly, like Persian rice is more expensive in the spectrum of your groceries. That said, I think it's worth it. And actually in our household, we eat a lot of rice and we often eat it with lentils or onions or other vegetable combinations. So even though you're, it feels weird to pay so much money for rice, it's a really quality ingredient. And it's not like you're cooking it with something very expensive. Like your Persian food actually is very inexpensive to prepare. So once you get past the rice and the saffron, you're good. Any other I, have questions? A, I actually have a, we have a, a rice question. If you don't wash the starch off the rice, does that change the outcome of the? Yes. So your rice is going to be sticky, stickier. So Persians are like really, um, I can't, I can, the only analogy I can make to this is how people in the South are about barbecue. I mean, I have no firsthand knowledge of this only from like watching the Food Network, but you know how they'll be like, oh, in Nashville, we do this to barbecue. And in Texas, we do that to barbecue. And everyone's very provincial and everyone has their right way of doing it. So Persians are like that about rice and other dishes as well, which we can talk about maybe later. But with the rice, you want it to be able to tell, separate by the grain. And you want your grains to be really long, which is part of the reason why you soak it. So um, it's that idea that you, it's just like, I guess it's like kind of considered like beauty to them, right? A beautiful plate of the rice where the grains fall apart. And it's actually interesting, years ago, this is actually my mom's story to tell, but I'll, it's not a big deal, I'll share. She had a, my mother came from Iran to America and her roommate in her college was a, 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 was a student from China. And so they both had this rice-based culture that they were coming from. And once the, um, her Chinese roommate's fiance came over for dinner and he was like in shock. He's like, I can, and he said to his fiance, I can count the grains, which is so interesting because in Chinese culture, you don't want to count the grains, whereas in Persian culture, you do. So that's just a little story. So you wash it because you're trying to also make it so that it will be like, um, it will be, you know, more individualized. Because even there are Persian dishes where your rice clumps together, like you make almost like a Persian cake, but you still want to be able to see those grains. You don't want them to melt into each other. Is that, is that okay? Somebody? Pretty good. Okay. So I think my water's boiling. So before I add this my rice, I'm going to drain it in the sink one last time. So 
So all I do, no colander necessary, I just put my hand here, pour out. If there's some water in the bottom, no biggie. And I'm gonna put this in the boiling water. And um, I, so I always set my timer, six minutes. All right, six minutes. Because if I don't, I won't, I won't remember. And I'm gonna let it boil. But before I do, I'm gonna stir it a few times. So this is a Persian spatula. And you can see, can you see the holes in it? So um, it's very similar to one of these, but um, I want to show you. And, then, and it's really interesting. If you ever go into a Persian store, they have beautiful ones, all shapes. I have actually one of my grandmother's, which is um, gorgeous, like Art Nouveau, uh, um, silver with birds and flowers. I mean, it's gorgeous, some gorgeous handmade stuff. So I'm gonna just um, take my spatula and gently just lift up the rice and let it go, right? Because again, you don't wanna break up the grains. That's like the big no-no. And then just let it be. Okay. So now, where are we at? So while this is boiling, I'm going to um, get started on my fish. So the first ingredient for the fish, and this is so important, is that you caramelize your onions. So I'm not talking about, like, I don't know what you would, what, what to be, but you can see I have two batches here that I made. Just to kind of show you from day to day, it can vary. Um, so can you see this? Like, what if this one's darker, this one's a little lighter. I actually sometimes will just saute like four onions and it takes about 20 minutes to really get them soft. So I'll start off on medium high and then slowly go down to low and let them chill and hang out. While I'm doing dishes or working with my kids or other things, just let them go. And every few minutes I go over and I stir the pot, kick them around a little bit and go back to doing what I was doing. And then I just divide them up. So, you know, like a pie. Oh, I put four onions in here, quarters. And then I put them each in like a plastic bag. So if I want to cook something, I already have it ready. And I love having this in my freezer. I actually made a pot of rice with lentils just to show you one way I use them in my rice cooker. And I'll show that later. So I have my onions and I have, um, and the first step is you want to really caramelize them which I'm not gonna do because it'll take too long. So I already did this. And I'm gonna add my three cloves of garlic. Now the other thing that I really love about Persian cooking is that it's, um, it freezes really well. I always say to friends, I'm like, if you're like a two family working family or you're really busy, Persian cooking is amazing because it's healthy. It freezes so well and it's nutritious. And um, I don't know, I haven't figured out why, like, culturally, people haven't figured, picked up on this more, because um, I always have tons of Persian food that I make. I always make it for a large amount, and then I freeze it in sections, something I learned from my parents, and it comes in so handy, and so much better than ordering in pizza or something like that. So I'm using this little burner, which is, um, I tested it out earlier, so I know it works. And I'm waiting to soften the garlic a little bit. And while that's going on, I have two minutes on my rice. So while I'm doing that, I'm gonna actually slice my, my potatoes. So the potatoes are gonna become a base for the rice. We cook the rice twice. Once we boil it, which is what we're doing now, I'm gonna drain it. And then we're gonna put the rice back in the pot with the potatoes and we're gonna steam it. And um, you'll see that, but I want to get my potatoes ready so that I can layer them when this is ready. So while I'm cutting, Danny, is there any questions? I know, I don't see any new ones. Okay, great. So I'm just cutting these um, a little bit smaller, maybe at a quarter of an inch. And I want to like also say that Persian cooking, one thing I love about it is it's very forgiving. And even the master cooks mess up sometimes, so you have to be like forgiving to yourself. Um, okay, so this is done. I'm gonna like go with my rice a minute early, which is fine. 
So my rice has been vigorously boiling. I'm gonna take a grain. So I'm sorry that you guys are not here in the we go. I'm gonna drain this and I'll be right back. A lot of us can come over. <laughs> so right off of, you want me to tell everyone where you live? Rob wouldn't mind. It's really good. Okay. So Shereen, um, yes. I got I got a few questions while you're doing that. So you made a big pitch for uh, instead of pizza. Um, so give us some examples of some easily easy family dishes that freeze well. Persian. Okay. You want an easy family dinner? Sure. Okay. So um, I I what I I I have different Persian spice rubs. So often I'll just take chicken breast and marinate it in a Persian spice rub overnight and then saute it. Um, and then I also have a Persian rice maker, which I love, and we use that a lot. So um, you'll see later, like I made a pot of, of lentil rice where I combined white basmati and brown basmati in my rice cooker with lentils and some of these fried onions. And it's a super nutritious meal. And our family actually eats, um, when we're having a vegetarian meal, my kids and I will have like Persian, the rice with um, yogurt. Um, and it's, 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 it sounds odd, but it's like such a delicious combination. Like for me, that's my comfort food. So um, a, an easy vegetarian dinner would be salad, a rice dish with some kind of bean mixed into it with other seasonings. And then, um, or like an easy a steamed rice with some kind of variation of, a protein mixed with a Persian spice rub. Does that sound? Is there any other questions? There is, but someone answered for you. They want to know if you were starting from raw or parboiled potatoes. The potatoes are raw. Yes. Okay. So while this is, let me turn this down for a second to get the rice going. So the modern Persian cook's best friend is Pam. Always put it on the bottom of your pot. Okay, now I'm gonna eyeball it, but I give you the measurements. Basically, this is what you wanna do. What did I say in the recipe? I'm just curious. Um, spray the bottom. Okay, half a cup of vegetable oil. You really wanna make sure that you coat it well. So depending on the size of your pot, it might be a quarter of a cup, it might be a little more. I'm gonna hold this up just so you can see. It's I mean, I don't know, it's hot. But anyways, it's, it's, you're, you're really coating it nicely. This is not a diet food. And anyways, it's Hanukkah, you're having latkes, we can do this too. Now the other trick is, I'm gonna put in a couple of tablespoons of water. I know that people who are very precise won't like this, but I'm just gonna be like, that looks good, okay. Now I'm gonna lay down my potatoes and I'll lift, I'll lift this up when I'm done, just so you can see. But I'm just layering them in. You can see how thick they are. Okay, great. All right, in honor of Hanukkah, my Hanukkah, what's my call it? Thing. Okay, so I'm showing you this. Let's see if this works. Can you see it? Um, yeah, right? So it's, I layered it just in a thin, there's lots of holes, that's fine. Because the rice itself also makes a really nice tadi crust. And I, I mean, really good Persian cooks do amazing things for this. I had this one aunt who was like incredible and she'll like layer zucchini slice and tomato and in the middle she'll put a whole head of garlic and she'll 
the rice will be a rice with dill and herbs and lima beans and it's so delicious like, i haven't had it in years but it's so good like one of these days i'm gonna have her teach me and then i put a little salt now we are ready to put in the rice and basically once you put the rice in the pot if you want to take a break and do something else you can and that's what i like about this dish so there have been times like when my kids were toddlers if they were taking a nap i would do this step which i'm about to do now and then I can leave it until it was time for dinner. So it's, it's very forgiving in that way. So here's my rice that I drained. And um, so here's the other thing, we're going back. Number one rule of Persian rice, you want your grains long, right? So you never just like chop in there and grab it. You gotta be nice and uh, delicate, pick it up from the side with your um, tool and layer it in. And here's the thing, once you've layered all your rice in, um, you actually try to like shape it up into a little bit of a cone. And that cone shape, it gives space for the rice at the bottom not to be squished and it can grow and fulfill its rice destiny. <laughs> all right, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna put this behind me. I know that like probably a lot of people know this, but I've made this mistake, so it's all something to be mindful of, is that when you're making Persian rice tabbiq, you really want the pot to be the size of your burner. Mm -hmm. So there have been times where I put it on my back burner and I'd be like, why isn't it steaming? Why isn't it getting hot? And of course it's because it's the wrong size burner for the pot. So you always wanna be mindful of that. So what are we gonna do next? Where's my lid? Where's my lid? All right, so if I wanted to, again, I could just leave it on the burner at this point and be done. Now, this is gonna come together fast. So let's do this, okay? So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on to now the steaming part of my rice. So we did the boiling part, we set it up with a tajik on the bottom, and now we're gonna steam it. And there's two parts to the steaming. There's a 10 minute high, high heat steam at medium, and then we add a little bit of liquid and oil that's gonna create another bus burst of steam and we turn it down to low for the rest of the time. Um, so let's do this. Okay. Again, the timer. It's off. Okay, so now we're back to the fish. All right. Here we go. Um, remind me, Danny, when we have another break, I, I actually brought out a book to show people different Persian rice dishes. Okay. Okay. So Thank you to remind me. Okay. Okay. So what I love about this is it all comes together very fast. So I have my salmon here on a tray. I put some spray on it. I'm going to uh, salt my salmon. And um, if you want to put like a little garlic powder, pepper, I'm not a big pepper person in our family, but um, in our family, we never, never use pepper for some reason, but I like a little garlic on it. And I can hear the sizzling, so that's good. It's getting warm. And then basically, I'm gonna add all the ingredients at the same time. So I have my orange marmalade, which is like a Persian secret ingredient. Marmalade, orange marmalade with the, with the skin or apricot jam are like flavor bombs in a lot of Persian food. So I added that. Here are my walnuts and a half a cup. So I just want to say like when I make this dish, I actually like to double the sauce because of my family, like we love the sauce, especially because it tastes so good mixed with the rice. But today I'm only doing one uh, one serving of the sauce, just so you see what it looks like on a pound of fish. But that's just something you can keep in mind. And also, you can make the sauce all the way and freeze it for like another day when you're, you know, too tired or you have company coming for Shabbat, but you have a long day at work that day. You can make it, freeze it, and take it out and, and put it on the salmon and cook it. So I'm going to just cook this. I have my um, saffron lemon juice in my So this is interesting. It, um, this is another star Persian ingredient. It's pomegranate molasses. 
and it's kind of making this like trendy out coming out of its on its own thing lately. And a lot of I see a lot of recipes calling for this, so I thought I'd share some knowledge that I just learned today myself. So I went to the Persian store, and he had this one, and he had Sadaf. So I said to him, is there really any difference? And what he said to me is that this brand, they, um, when they make it, it's so interesting, I couldn't be at this level. The white stuff of the pomegranate gets kind of mixed in, so it's much more bitter. He said the sadaf is more um, the fruit, unless they don't really, they're much more careful when they make it. So if you have a choice, if it's worth it, and this was, this was $6 um, to get the sadaf. And then there's another one that's called pomegranate, concentrate and that's the sweetest and personally i'd rather get the molasses and if it tastes too bitter to me either add more of the jam or add a little sugar so that's your little tidbit for that and so i have my palm i'm going to just use this because i already have it and it's fine i'm just saying if you go out to buy it so i have three tablespoons i'm eyeballing it the thing about these dishes is that as long as you're in the ballpark, it's going to be delicious. And you can always add a little more of this or a little bit more of that. It's not like French cuisine that's so specific, um, at least for these kind of dishes. And I love that about Persian cuisine. Um, you can talk to somebody about it at a, at a party and go home and try it. You don't really need to write it down, as long as you know the fundamentals of how things come together. And then the last bit is the lemon juice and the saffron. So here it is. I'm just gonna eyeball a teaspoon or so. Now, if you look at it now, it's kind of palish. I'm gonna bring it up to you in a minute. I just want to stir it a little more. So, and basically now I have my mixture, right? Did I do everything on my list? Let's just check. Uh, walnuts, pomegranate, orange, lemon. Yep, we're good. All right, so here's what it looks like. Um, okay, can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So what's going to happen is that when you cook it, it's going to actually get darker and it, and this is the finished product um, right here. So this is one I made earlier today. Um, and you can see how the color gets darker when it goes under in the oven for at 400 degrees. So what was interesting is that when I made this today, I actually had made this um, sauce and then like two hours later I put on the salmon. And if you want to make a note to the recipe, I think it's nice if you can let it sit because then some of the juice gets absorbed by the walnut mixture, the walnuts. Anyway, so now this is ready. I'm putting it on my salmon and I'm gonna throw it in the oven. Great. Okay. So that's done. Now, I'm gonna go, oh, what I wanted to just tell you is that, you guys totally can't see this, but it's a grain of rice that I've cooked. And um, what I'm trying, I wanted to kind of try to show you is that when you cook the, see how, you can see. Uh, is that when you, when you do that first boil of the rice, you don't wanna cook it all the way, you're actually just parboil, you're parboiling it. You want to kind of have a little bit of that al dente quality um, and that's what that six minute boil is. Kind of cooking it halfway. And if you put it between your fingers, you can kind of just feel that there's like a, um, a rigidity to it, rigidity. Okay, so my rice is really steaming. Can you guys see that? I don't know if you can, but I'm taking that as a clue that instead of waiting for 10 minutes, I'm gonna, put, I'm gonna turn down the heat now and do my final step. So, the final step of the rice is the last steam. And for that, there's two important steps. Three, actually. 
So first of all, I'm going to take off the lid. And as you see in the notes, I have a mixture of water and oil. And I have my awesome Persian spatula or the good old American one. And I pour it over the rice. And the reason that these holes are so important is it slows it down the, um, the flow of the water and oil and it dispute, distributes it all over the surface. So. And did you hear that? It's like snack, crackle, pop. I don't know if you can hear it. But it's like the snack, crackle, pop of Persian rice, and that's how I know that it was the right time. So I did that. I turned, I'm going to turn my heat down to low, and this is the last secret of good tagzik, which is that you put a towel around your pot lid, because what it does is that this towel absorbs the extra moisture so that the bottom of the crust gets really crispy. Your crust will still be great without it, it's just gonna be soggy. And what I do um, is I use these clips and I put the towel on it and then I just clip it and I'm good. Okay, so that's done. The salmon's in the oven. We're doing good. I think, what, how, what time is it? Danny, you, share out the time. You're 8.41, you're good. Woo, we're doing good, Woo. okay. Now we get to have fun. We're going to plate everything, all right? So let me clean up my mess. Um, any other questions right now? Uh, let's see. Do, do you overlap the potatoes? You can't. If they're really thin, you can't. You know, you can like go on to um, Pinterest or other websites and see how different people do tagi. It's just, and then it's just a matter of kind of knowing how to um, gauge the heat. Because people do beautiful things where they, they make it very thin and then they overlap it, um, almost like a, some fancy French dish that has overlapped potatoes. I don't know what you call it. But anyways, there's tons, there's like no end. I actually did a tadi recently. You know those, um, I, people are into cooking? This summer, everyone was making focaccia that had like flowers on it made out of peppers and cucumbers, I don't know, cucumbers or whatever, scallions. And they would bake it and then you have like this pretty floral scene on your focaccia. So, Someone came up with the idea of doing that with tadik. So I gave it a shot. I was like, I gotta try it. So I used orange potatoes and purple potatoes and white potatoes and did this abstract floral tadik. And it was fun, something different. It didn't, it didn't come out the way my mind wanted it to, but that was okay. So here's what I wanna tell you. This dish is delicious as it is, but if you take this extra step, it's like amazing. So. Cilantro and pomegranate are like a match made in heaven. It's so delicious when you mix them together. So I have my cilantro and um, make sure you wash it well because it can be very gritty. A little secret someone once told me is that if you put some, you soak it in a, in a bowl with water and salt and so there's something about the chemistry that causes the um, dirt to go to the bottom of the bowl. So I'm gonna put some cilantro on it. I like, I like a lot of cilantro. And then I have my pomegranate. And it looks so pretty and then it's like really good because the pomegranate like pops in your mouth and you have the cilantro, it's just really good. It's like really, it's just, it's, I actually can't, I, when I made this for my family, I was like, it's such a quick dish. My son was like, it was a weeknight. He's like, you made this on a weeknight? I'm like, yes I did. It's actually very doable. You can do this. So here you go. Can you see? I'll bring you up to the camera. So here it is. The final dish. Now, if you're vegetarian, if you're like want to ever do it as a vegetarian meal, um, Persian cuisine is actually amazing. I think it has so many options for vegans and vegetarians. So what I did, this is already plated. But I roasted some kombucha squash, and then in this case, the sauce isn't as dark because I only sauteed it here. But I bet if you wanted it to get more caramelized, I'm going to show you in a minute. Hang on. Um, if you want to get more caramelized, you can just be patient and stir it for a little bit longer, and it probably would turn darker after a bit of time. But what I did is, let me first show you. So this is actually a great Shabbat appetizer, too, if you want to do it like that. So here it is. Plated with the, I put the sauce underneath it with the squash hop. 
That's just like something I saw fancy chefs do, so I just thought I'd try it. And um, again, the same thing. You know, put your cilantro on it and your pomegranate. And it's so delicious. All right, so that's that. And now we get to serve the rice. So I'm gonna put these over here. I have a few questions. Go ahead. They're all from your temple buddies too, just so you know. So one is, what are you using for cherry water on the tardik? What? What are you using for cherry water on the tardik? Oh, did I say cherry? That was, you know, I did, I edited an old recipe and I didn't catch that. Let me see. Oh yeah. It just, sorry everyone. I'll actually have Danny um, email everybody a new version of this because we're just using water today. That was from another cooking class where we made cherry rice, which we can do another time if you guys are interested. So here's my question. We have another question. Go ahead. If you cook with fresh pomegranate, do you use whole seeds or do you extract the juice and dispose of the seeds? I've never cooked with whole pomegranate. And actually, um, I didn't put it in this recipe, but you can just use, if you want, you can use pomegranate juice. I would just buy like a bottle of palm and just let it boil down until it thickens and gets a little bit uh, richer. Does that answer the question? That's good. Okay. And another temple buddy of yours wants to know, how do you prepare the squash? Oh, the squash? Okay, great question. So I roasted in the oven at like 425, but I was actually, I, I just Googled it. If you just Google how to roast squash, you'll find tons of simple recipes. It's just olive oil, the squash, and a little bit of salt on a piece of parchment paper. And depending on the kind of squash you use. So when I did the picture for the cooking class, I used delicata squash, which is so pretty because it has these like groove, like flower-like shape almost to it. This time I used kombucha squash, which I love and is my new favorite. Um, but anyways, I did a lot of that. It's very easy to just Google and then kind of play with it until it gets that level of caramelization that you like. But don't be afraid to cook it too long. It's, it's the more caramelized it is, the better it's gonna be. Okay. So here's a rice I did earlier. Fingers crossed, it's uh, good, we'll see. So like you said, as you see, I might put that away. Okay, there we go. And I'll use my American. So then, now it's time to serve it. And as you notice, no bowls. Like we don't do bowls, we do trays. You can do a bowl if you want, but trays are better. That's the Persian way. And again, it's because we want the rice to be long. We don't want to break it up. Okay. So here's my rice. And some kinds of rice are like more dense and you can actually flip over the pot. And I'll do that with my rice cooker rice in a minute. So I can like smell the potato. Oh, it's perfect, I think. I don't want to jinx myself. All right. Now I'm going to put, you don't have to do this step, but I'm going to do it just to show you. Because I have extra saffron water. I'm putting some rice in this bowl. Oh, I know it's a bowl. It's a bowl, but that's okay. For this, you can do it. All right. This is the exception to the rule. All right. Now I use my spatula and I just lift out my tadik and lay it on top. And I know you can't see it probably because of this pan, but. I'll bring it up to the camera in a minute. It came out really good. I really love these pans. Okay, awesome. Okay. And sometimes like, um, and my mother would serve the, we'll serve the tag on a separate plate, but I'm just gonna put it here for the sake of the situation. It's really hot. 
Okay. And last but not least, crispy rice. All right, we're good. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my saffron water that's left over, not all of it. This is like very rich. You don't need a lot of it to make a big impact. So pour some of that in there. Put it back on your mat or your um, cutting board because you don't want to put it on your counter. I mean, it will come off, but you know, if you can avoid it, it's better. Um, And then I'm just going to gently, you know, kind of fluff this so that the orange goes all over. There we go. Ta -da! All right. So here's our Persian rice with head beak. So the saffron rice is on top, and you see the crispy tabique, and uh, some of the potato, some of the ricey tabique is right there. It's really, so this is like a great way to get your potato and oil fix on Hanukkah. Now what I'm going to do is I also made a rice in my rice cooker because that's what I do on Sunday. I make a lot of rice for the week ahead. And so I thought you guys could see. So this is, um, so this is my Persian rice cooker, and it's great. It makes three cups of rice, which is perfect for my family. And like I said, I often cook rice with different um, vegetables, and then my kids will eat it for lunch and different things. And now that we're all home with COVID, um, we're eating a lot of this kind of stuff. So this is a beautiful book I want to show you. It's called The New Food of Life. This really is my Persian cooking Bible. And if you ever want to get a Persian cookbook, this is the one I recommend. Um, her recipes are flawless. They always work out for me. And it's also just like a cultural lesson. She has beautiful poetry in here. And you really get a taste of what the culture is like. So if you go through her book, she has different um, Persian rice dishes. So this is like a lot, this is um, a rice, let me bring it up to you. Let's see. So here's like a rice, a baked rice where they flipped it over, the pot over, and then you see the crusty rice. Um, this is called uh, the jewel rice. And actually, if they, what they did, it looks like is they steamed the white rice, but then they put barberries, pistachios, and orange peel. So as you serve it, you take a little bit of everything onto your plate. Um, but then there's also amazing rices with, oh, here's sour cherry rice. And, um, and this is like my favorite tomato rice, like where they put tomato paste in it. One thing I do want to say though about these cookbooks, and this goes back to that whole idea of like regional cuisine that we have like in the South or, um, what do they call it? Like New England clam chowder versus like Manhattan clam chowder, like one's red, one's white. So Persians are like, like the Iranian cuisine is very much like that too. And, and so there's, first of all, there's provincial ways of making things. And then there's also the Jewish versus the Muslim way. So this is a Muslim cookbook. So like there's certain way, things in here that I know, I read your recipe, but I know our family doesn't do that. Um, whenever we make a rice, we always make it vegetarian, whereas a lot of her recipes have meat cooked in the rice and that way the rice dish I think cannot either be a meat meal or a it's part and then you can have it however you want and then all in their cooking which we don't do like I've never there's maybe like one Persian dish that I know that I never really make but I know of it and it has yogurt in it and you bake it um, but there's other little nuances in um, the way you make your chicken soup or the spices you use in your rice Persian joke is that like a husband and wife get married and after the first Shabbat, the groom comes home and he's like, I'm not going to stay married to her. And the mother's like, why, why, what happened? He's like, she put chickpeas in her chicken soup. And like, the like Persians think that's like the funniest thing. Because the idea like, oh my gosh, you don't put chickpeas in your soup, you put potatoes in your soup. Like everyone, and they're very fastidious about what they do and how they do it. What's the name of the book again? 
um, New Food of Life. And I'm just going to spell the author's last name because it's, it's a tricky one. B-A-T-M-A-N-G-L-I-G-A. J. Because she talks about like cooking and ceremonies. You know, there is um, an Iran, uh, 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 how do I want to say this? Religious woman in this community who wrote a Persian cookbook, her husband's Persian. I, I bought it. Um, and it's very beautiful, but um, in terms of the recipes, this is the book you want. Like her book is pretty and stuff like that. And, um, but if you have her book and you don't want to buy this one, I can also talk to you about how to just kind of take her, her things and just make them a little bit better. All right, so um, it's called, hers is called like Jewish Bride or Persian Jewish Bride or something like that. All right, so here I have my rice cooker. I love this because I throw the ingredients in and I forget about it. So this one is going to look a little bit different because I made it healthier with um, brown rice and white rice combination. And I'm just going to flip it. Can you take the rice cooker away from me? And we'll see what happens. I don't know. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It's hot. So just drink. Yes. Take this away. All right. Oh, very nice. So this is like a rice cake. And you can see that what I did is I, I cooked lentils. Um, and then I also had the onion and I just kind of layered them in with the rice. And then it makes it naturally makes tidy. I didn't add, I also added less oil so it's not as shiny and as uh, crispy, but it's better for everyday eating. So that's that. And I think that we covered everything that I wanted to cover in the hour. Let's see. Any other questions? Um, yeah, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I think we're good. We're good. Well, that's a great job there, Shireen. So, looks good. We'll be over within a half. Oh, I live 15 minutes, not even. Right. We'll be over. I'll make you guys, you get, you get your goodie bag for being my uh, moderator. The moderator's goodie bag. So, a couple of things we want to, uh, first of all, of course, we want to thank Shireen. And she did this under pressure because her mother's been watching the entire time. And obviously... <laughs> So uh, we had a very nice uh, representation. We had uh, 56 participants, which for a cooking webinar, I think is the highest we have had to date. And we have represented all over North America from Southern California <laughs> to uh, all the way up to Canada. So really, really nice to uh, see that. Uh, if you missed the beginning, these are webinars. Now that you've registered, you'll be getting all of our future ones from Federation Jewish Men's Club. You certainly don't have to be a man to participate in these. Um, but if you are, we'd love you to uh, participate in all of the FJMC events. So uh, Shireen had one request and I would like to honor that. Um, and because it's all volunteer, we're a whole volunteer organization. Obviously she put a lot, a lot of work and time into this uh, effort and to reward her for that what she what shireen asked is if you would give a donation to mazon mazon is the jewish answer to hunger it is a jewish group that supports hunger um, throughout the world so mazon.org is uh, you can go on the website and give a donation uh, to that in addition shireen we i will make a donation on your behalf to Wine on the Vine, which is uh, kind of the 2020 version of JNF, except we're planting vines. Um, I know, I know it. Josh actually interned for them two summers ago. Oh, that's great information. Yeah, so we, we are actually, our region actually bought a vine and our club is on its way to buying our brother oh, chapters Thank on you. its way to doing that. So we will, I will, uh, you'll see that in your Thank email you so within much. the next 24 hours. Um, so thank you again, 
And uh, if anyone has any questions and doesn't want to uh, directly contact Shreem, um, feel free to reach out to myself. Yeah, I mean, I love, I, I mean, obviously I'm very passionate about this and I love it. So if, if you're in the community and you ever want to talk or have a question or something, I mean, you can always email me through the temple. Um, you know, my, our, our contact information is there or find me on Facebook. Um, because I love sharing this and talking about it. And if you fail, that's okay. We can problem solve around it. Um, and if you have success, I want to share it with you. I mean, just tonight, a friend of mine sent me a picture of, she did the recipe earlier today and sent me a picture of it. And it was just, it's, it's very rewarding. I love that. So please share. Um, either way, I, I'm, I'd love to continue to learn with you and, and help out if I can. It looks absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Who's going to eat all that now? Um, I'm done for the week. <laughs> I'm done. You know, if you haven't met her husband, it's amazing that he's as thin as he is mm. with all that good food. So it's very good. Thin. Thank you, everyone. We hope to see thank you again. You and happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Danny, thank you. Thank, thank you, Tom. You. That was thank you, great. everyone. Great happy job. Hanukkah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Very good. Thank you Appreciate so much. It. Yes, thank you, Shereen. We loved it. Oh, my pleasure. I'm so glad you were here. Nice seeing you, Karen. Thank, thank you, Shereen. My pleasure. It was nice seeing some of the wonderful. temple people today. Yeah, thank you I very much. Sure out. Hey, Shereen, how do you store your saffron and your um, pomegranate? Great Please. question. Hang on a second. I sort of, I just realized like, I want to turn check on the uh, salmon. So give me a second. Oh, go ahead. Pam, just give me a second. Um. Thanks for the reminder. I just checked on my salmon too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so the saffron. What I do is. If I have leftover saffron like this, I save it in, I, I have a collection of small jars. You know those, um, you know when you go into a fancy restaurant and they give you a little thing of jam? Yeah. I actually save those, I put them in my purse and I hoard them. And then I wash it out and I use it for my saffron jar. So I'll put it in there and then you put a thin layer of um, oil. So it doesn't form a mold and it stays in the fridge. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you can find other little, but basically the idea is you want to find a little container. That sounds great, thank you. Yeah. You ever need jam? I know I know of a really nice store. It's called Stonewall Kitchen. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you mean like, can you, can you get us a stash of small little glass containers for our next cooking class? Okay, <laughs> don't tell anyone. All right, everyone, thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Shereen. Hey, Mom, I'll talk to you in a few.